We should have had this dialogue a long time ago, a long time, frankly, before I got to office. And I think we're all uh, to blame. I do feel that uh, we have both made some mistakes. The United States has been foolish, he said, and he didn't criticize Russia there. Remember, Tom, when Republicans didn't like presidents on foreign soil casting any sort of blame on the United States? Well, you know, from the beginning of this process, um, one of the things that shocked me most, Allison, is the willingness of Republicans um, uh, and even Republican national security experts like John Bolton, who a year ago, now the president's national security advisor, but when he was just a conservative commentator a year ago, um, called Russia's intervention on our election uh, an act of war. And now, as the president's national security advisor is calling it a witch hunt, the most shocking thing about all of this is the willingness of so many Republicans in office to abase themselves, to lay down their ethics and morals for a president who is not only himself uh, a, a deeply indecent person, but who is lying time and again. Their willingness to do that for a president who would sell each and every one of them down the river in a split second if it served his interest. It's shocking to see so many Republicans lay themselves down that way. As I noted in my column, at least Stormy Daniels got paid for her silence. So you note, as you're laying this all out there, that you think all this pushes the United States into a new phase in the Trump presidency, one where you are very concerned about unintended consequences. What does that mean? Well, you know, John, when you, when you do so many things that the president is doing right now, from a trade war uh, with Russia to a, with, sorry, with China and, and our European allies in Canada, um, to all the other things he is doing on the world stage, none of them, the process of any interagency review, uh, let alone hearings. Let, let's just take the, trillion, the, the tax cut for uh, corporations. I actually support a tax cut for corporations, but it should have been balanced off with a tax hike on some other uh, uh, products and services. Otherwise, we're going to end up with a trillion dollars more in debt. That's going to push up interest rates. That will strengthen the dollar. And by the way, that will increase the trade deficit. The, and, and now we're seeing that come through. Remember, remember what the president and Republicans said, that tax cuts will pay for themselves. Well, the data out just yesterday mm -hmm. shows that's not happening at all. So you're going to get all these unintended consequences then bouncing off one another. But, Tom, is it, to quote James Carville, just the economy stupid? I mean, are the Republicans doing what you say and sort of compromising what they previously held very close as their dear principles because the economy is doing well, the unemployment rate at the moment is down, and all the things are humming on all cylinders? You know, Allison, if I were to burn all the furniture in my house, I could really keep it pretty warm and toasty for a while. Uh, but when the fire goes out, I'll have nowhere to sit. That's really what I'm, I'm worried about right now. Let's take the trade issue for a second. Um, uh, how would I think a rational president approach this? First of all, let me be very clear. I have supported the president on the China trade issue. We have a trade problem with China. China got rich over the last 30 years through hard work, investing in infrastructure, investing in education, delayed gratification, and cheating on WTO rules, non-reciprocal trade arrangements, and um, general shenanigans about not allowing our companies the same access we allow theirs. They got rich over the last 30 years around tennis shoes, t-shirts, and solar panels with that strategy. If we allow that strategy to go forward, on the issue of aerospace, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, supercomputing. We're going to have a real problem. The president's right on that. But how would you approach that? Well, I'd approach that by first getting all my Asian allies on my side. I might even sign a trade agreement. Uh, we call it TPP, for instance. Then at the same time, I'd get my European allies on my side because they have the same problem with China. I wouldn't slap steel and steel aluminum tariffs on them. Then I'd sit down with the Chinese in secret, in private, and say, now we're going to have a trade negotiation. I'm not going to get in your face. We're both going to come out and announce a win. But we would have real leverage on our side. Instead, Trump blew up TPP. He blew up relations with the EU. And he did the whole thing in public. And now it's a big face issue. 
between us and China. Thomas, stick around. We're going to talk to you much more in just a second. We want to do a quick reset. We want to thank our international viewers for joining us right now. For you, CNN Talk is next. For our U.S. viewers, New Day with Thomas Friedman continues right now. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to your new day. So the White House caving to mounting criticism, and they have now postponed that second Trump-Putin meeting that the president had wanted. President Trump had just invited Vladimir Putin to Washington last week, even though President Trump was almost universally criticized for taking Putin's word over that of his own intelligence agencies while in Helsinki. Putin apparently never responded to the White House invite, so now National Security Advisor John Bolton claims the president decided to wait until what they call the Russian witch hunt is over. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo really clashed with Democratic and Republican senators on Capitol Hill. They want to know what the president agreed to with Vladimir Putin, and the Secretary of State more or less refused to tell them. So we want to bring back New York Times foreign affairs columnist and author of the bestseller. Thank you for being late, Thomas Friedman, with us again. Let's run down some of this news that really has developed over the last 24 hours. And since you wrote that column, Thomas, you were concerned that the president's putting Russia first, not America first. He has since suggested, or John Bolton has, I suppose, that this meeting to the, with the White House with Vladimir Putin is going to be delayed. Do you see that as a positive development? Yeah, I mean, I never understood why the first meeting had to happen, let alone the second one. Um, you know, we do have issues with Russia, but they're really all about Russia's behavior. You know, let's remember uh, a Dutch-Australian inquiry, which came out a few months ago, found that Russia was responsible for providing the weapons that shot down a Malaysian civilian mm -hmm. airliner over Ukraine. Um, uh, we know what Russia has been doing in Syria. We know they've seized Crimea. Um, and are intervening in Ukraine with their little green men. We have a lot of issues with Russia. I'm all for, for talking about them. But it should be on our terms, not, not, not their terms. Hey, Tom, you brought up what the, the shift, the 180-degree turn that John Bolton, National Security Advisor, has made in exactly one year. And just to put a finer point on it, I want to read what you're referring to to the viewers. So a year ago... John Bolton wrote this op-ed about Russia. He said, attempting to undermine America's Constitution is far more than just a quotidian covert operation. It is, in fact, a true act of war and one that Washington will never tolerate. Fast forward one year. Here's what he said yesterday. The president believes that the next bilateral meeting with President Putin should take place after the Russia witch hunt is over. So we've agreed that it will be after the first of the year. How do you explain what has happened to John Bolton in one year that he now believes that an investigation into what he considered an act of war is a witch hunt? Well, Allison, the, the degree of careerism and sycophancy um, in Bolton, who called it an act of war a year ago, now, now calling it a witch hunt, it, it, it just takes your breath away. Um, and, and it's so serious because year one of Trump, uh, I described as President Trump unhinged but bound, bound by a serious national security advisor, H.R. McMaster, bound by a secretary of state who was ready to tell him no, a Tillerson, bound by Gary Cohn, who would tell him no on trade tariffs. He got rid of all of those. And he got rid of, and, and getting rid of all those people, the people who came in and took those jobs, Pompeo as secretary of state, Bolton as um, national security advisor, um, uh, and others, and uh, Larry Kudlow on the national economic team, those people knew when they came in that Trump had uh, executed via Twitter their three predecessors for daring to stand up to him. So from day one, they, they clearly agreed to step over the bodies of those people and do and say whatever Trump wanted. Now, these people seem to have forgotten there's something called Google, where we can actually look up what they said. And again, as I was m remarking earlier, it's just shocking to see people abase themselves uh, for these jobs um, uh, at, at such a key time on such key issues. Well, Secretary of State Pompeo, who replaced Rex Tillerson, who you were talking about, was up on Capitol Hill yesterday, and he was facing a lot of questions about what we've been talking about, which is the Russia meeting. What did President Trump agree to with Vladimir Putin? What did he confront him on? And we just don't know, because there were only two people plus interpreters in that room. Let's just play a little bit of the heated exchange between the Secretary and, and Senator Bob Menendez. Has the president told you what he and President Putin discussed in their two-hour closed-door meeting in Helsinki? Presidents have a prerogative to choose who's in meetings or not. I'm confident you've had private one-on-one -on -one meetings in your life as well. You've chosen that setting as 
the most efficient way to... I just asked you a simple question. Did to, you, I, I just, I, I, you can't I, eat up my seven minutes, answer, Mr. Senator. Secretary. Did, did, you, did he tell you what, whether or not uh, what happened in those two hours? Yes, Senator. The predicate of your question implied some notion that there was something improper about having a one-on-one -on -one meeting. I completely disagree you, with just, the premise I, of your question. I didn't ask you a predicate. I asked you a simple question. I hope we're going to get through it. Did he tell you what transpired in the two-hour meeting? I've had a number of conversations with President Trump about what transpired in the meeting. Is that what you were talking about before, Thomas? Is that a reasonable answer from the Secretary of State? It's just shocking. The, to compare a private meeting of a senator with a summit that was largely held in private by the President of the United States with a leader accused of interfering in our elections on his behalf, to compare those two is preposterous. Uh, I listened to that hearing. I didn't listen to every word, but I listened to a lot of it. And it was very obvious that Pompeo could not say directly that he knew everything um, that went on in that private meeting. We also know that the director of national intelligence, Dan Coats, was not consulted about another summit with Putin. We've read that uh, General Dunford, the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, you know, doesn't know what was going on there. That, that's just appalling. And so where does that leave us? How will we ever know? And if we never know, which is more likely, what happened during those two hours, what, what is that? Where does that leave the American public? Allison, we have a real problem. We have a president without shame, backed by a party with no spine, echoed by a network without integrity. That is a, that is a huge alliance that is ready to lay itself down for anything this president wants. And there is only one answer to that. There has to be a check on this president's power. That is what the next midterm elections are about. I am not some raving Democrat or, or liberal, if you know my, uh, my, my column. I'm, I have some uh, conservative twitches as well. But I know one thing. There is only one issue on the agenda of the 2018 election. Will we have a check on this man's power? Therefore, you must run as a Democrat, vote as a Democrat, canvass for a Democrat, raise money for a Democrat, or drive a Democrat to the polls. That is the only way we are going to get a check on his power. This is not about liberal uh, 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 legislation. Nothing's going to happen between 2018 and 2020. Trump's not going to sign anything. But there has to be, for the sake of our country, a check on this man's power when you have a president with no shame, a party with no spine, backed by a network ready to be his bullhorn and parrot, there has to be an independent check on his power. Well, there is a suggestion from some people that we have on this show, and there was a suggestion from Secretary of State Mike Pompeo yesterday that in a way there is a check. If you look at what the government has done versus what the president is saying, it is different. Right now, this summit, the second summit, has been delayed. Yesterday, the government put out a statement saying that the United States does not recognize the Russian occupation of Crimea. Yesterday, there was an announcement of some kind of an agreement between the United States and the EU on trade, at least a deal to talk about a deal. The tensions were reduced. So is the actual action different than the words? I think, the, I think there is some truth to that. I think we have to say there's some truth to that. But I think those restraints were put on by the previous team. And I certainly don't trust the new team uh, to contain those, to, to, to retain those kind of restrictions or to implement them in an effective way. What in the world, in, in what planet in the Milky Way galaxy would it make sense for us to have had Putin here one more time after this crazy meeting that we have known nothing about what actually transpired there? What, what in the world is that about? And by the way, I mean, the reporting from behind the scenes is that, yes, while President Trump's administration has been tough on Russia in terms of sanctions and expelling diplomats more than any other country, the reporting is that he was dragged reluctantly to do these things. So it's not as big of a chasm between what he says and what he does as we might think, that he sometimes his administration boxes him in and he has to impose sanctions but his natural inclination is not to do so and th and, and that's the point as a lot of those restraints were put in place by the previous national security team and when you see john bolton going from saying that it, russia's intervention in our election was an act of war to to the fact that it's a witch hunt do you really trust going forward what he's going to do and that's why we have to have a check on the power of this president uh, that is the only way uh, that we can be assured that our interests, that we will have an administration that's putting America first, not Trump first, 
and not Russia first. What happens next? What happens next, do you think, as this summer goes on? And, and I keep going back to this meeting with the head of the European Union yesterday, because he did seem to come here wanting to deal and wanting to move forward. Does that mean perhaps the contention that we saw with the NATO leaders will be put in the rearview mirror? Yes, it's so hard to predict that because, look, I'm a firm believer that some things are true even if Donald Trump believes them. And I, I say that all the time. And some of the things that he is, is doing, I, I support uh, on China. It's just a question of, you know, are you going to get it done in a way, in a rational way? You know, one of the problems of all this personal diplomacy is when you've made it personal with Kim Jong-un, the leader of, of North Korea. And, and I think the president deserves a high mark so far for what he's done with North Korea. But when it's all personal, if the other guy starts cheating on you, you're very reluctant to call him on it because you've made this so personal that it really involves you having to back down in ways that can be very embarrassing. Same with Putin. There's a reason we have a process for doing these things. There's a reason you have congressional hearings for doing these things. And, and always remember one thing. We haven't had a crisis yet. We have not had a crisis. All the only crises we've had are the ones Trump has created. What if we have a big crisis? And we look around and we discover, as, as my friend Dove Seidman likes to say, that we have a president with formal authority, but no moral authority. That will be hugely consequential in a crisis. And that's what worries me most going forward. Tom Friedman, author of Thank You for Being Late.